All right. I'm going to, I guess I'll have you turn, if you will, please, to the book of Philippians chapter 2. But I want to build off of uh, something that uh, I shared on Sunday morning for Matthew 3. Sunday mornings, we've begun a journey through the book of Matthew, 28 chapters. We're on chapter 3. And uh, if you were here on Sunday morning, you, you recall this verse from Matthew 3. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. I want to take that uh, thought, which is really symbolic of the Holy Spirit's anointing of Jesus for his public ministry. I want to take that thought and I want to build upon that this evening by having you turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to share some verses from that passage in just a moment. But I want to say this. Overall, the Bible says that the main reason that Jesus came into this world was to save sinners. But to save sinners, Jesus, who is the eternal God, had to become a man. In addition to becoming a man, he had to qualify as mankind's Savior. And in order to do that, he had to live a life of complete obedience to the Heavenly Father. He had to resist the temptations to sin. And he had to carry out perfectly his Father's will. How did he do it? If I would ask the average Christian how he did it, I think most believers would answer, to be perfectly obedient to his Father's will, he used his divine power that was available to him because he's God. But that answer is actually not accurate. No. The believer, if you're one of them, is called to be like Jesus. He's our pattern as believers. We're to follow in his footsteps. We're not God. So how could we ever be expected to live like him? What if I told you that although Jesus was fully God on earth, he had to depend upon the Holy Spirit to enable him to live a godly life and to accomplish the, the purpose that the Father sent him here to do, just as you and I have to. That's what I want to share with you tonight as we have turned already to Philippians chapter 2. Look with me beginning at verse 6. It's talking about Jesus coming to this earth for the Father's purpose. Who, Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's pause and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight for who Jesus is and uh, what he accomplished. I thank you for the encouragement that we can get from this passage. And we come to realize that he has set a pattern for our very life and any service that we do for the Lord as well. Lord, I pray that you will use this to both convict and to change and to encourage our hearts. We thank you for what you'll do. We thank you most of all, Jesus, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I want you to see in those three verses that I just read there in Philippians chapter 2, one thing, humility. You see that? He humbled himself. He humbled himself to be totally obedient to his Father's will. That is Jesus. I've read that to you, and I'm sharing this with you tonight because I believe that if you recognize and understand the Holy Spirit's work in the life of the earthly Jesus, that you will then understand how the Holy Spirit works in you. Because He is the pattern for our power. Now, in reading those verses you see Jesus' humility. And one of the main ways in which he humbled himself is that he who is God eternal willingly limited himself. He confined himself, God, Jesus is God, he confined himself to a fragile human body like yours and mine. He chose to set aside what was rightfully his and to take on frail, limited human ability. That's what these verses are teaching us. These verses teach us that he is still God, but he willingly set aside his rights as God and lived as a man in a human body and took upon the limits of a physical condition which forced him to rely upon the Holy Spirit of God for his wisdom and for his power. And when you recognize that, then you realize, you know what? He was a man just like me. He was a human being just like me. And the way he succeeded in his life is the way that I succeed in my life spiritually. And that is, I rely on the Holy Spirit for his wisdom and power, just like Jesus did. He would not be our pattern. He would not be our example as believers if he simply was relying upon the fact that he was God to get it done. I've read in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16 where we have him baptized, and we see clearly present there at his baptism, literally visibly at his immersion, we see the Holy Spirit of God specially equipping him to do all that the Father asked of him. Because what happens when he is baptized is he comes up having been immersed or submerged under the water, when he comes up out of that water, the Spirit of God takes the form of a dove and lands and rests upon the head of the Messiah, of Jesus. And that is an image, that is a picture, that is symbolic of, that is representative of the fact that uh, he is being anointed. He is at that moment the anointed Messiah, enabled by the Holy Spirit to enter now and to begin his public ministry. That is a picture, and that is, pictures the fact that the Holy Spirit is Jesus' source of leading in his life. For example, in chapter 4 of the book of Matthew, and the very first verse, then after this baptism, after that anointing, he, Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Spirit of God becomes the source of his leading and the power during his earthly life and ministry. In fact, listen to this. This is a summary statement when Peter is uh, telling the people in Cornelius' household about Jesus. Here's what he says. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who then went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. I mean, come on, could it be any clearer? That all that Jesus did 
was the result of the fact that the Father anointed him with the Spirit, which enabled him to perform the ministry that he performed. Jesus himself said in various chapters of John's Gospel, chapter 5, chapter uh, 7, chapter 8, chapter 14, he says in chapter 14, the words that I speak unto you aren't from myself, they're from my Father, and the works that I do are from my Father. They're through by the, the Father's empowering me. He says, indwelling me. Well, we know who indwelt him was none other than the spirit of the living God. And so he tells us through his humility how he performed his ministry. He was anointed. He limited himself to become a man and was an anointed man. He was an anointed human being just like you and I can be. Now, look in Philippians 2 again. This time, jump up one verse. Go up to verse 5. Notice this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, again, what's the summary word that I just gave you that uh, sums up everything in verses 6 to 8 about Jesus? Humility, right? Humility. Well, what we are told in verse 5 is that there is to be a similarity between us and the humility of Jesus. The same mind. We're called to share the same attitude that Jesus had. Like Jesus accepted the Father's assignment and fulfilled it by the power of the Holy Spirit at work through Him, so must we. And that calls for us to be humble. That is, if this mind of Jesus, this same mind, this similarity of humility be in us, then we have to be humble. We need an attitude of humbleness. And the way that we have an attitude of humbleness is to first of all recognize and then admit the fact of our own personal inability to even live for God, let alone serve God without the Holy Spirit's empowerment in our lives. I heard uh, more than one preacher say, uh, we as God's people ought to obey our Lord's last command. And then they say his last command was, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. I don't have a problem with that. But I don't think that was his last command. His last command is in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, where he commanded his disciples, Tarry ye here in Jerusalem until you are endued, until you are clothed with power from on high. And he's talking about the Pentecostal power of the Holy Spirit Amen. coming upon them. So before he tells them to go, he tells them to wait. Tarry, wait until you're anointed by the because without the power of the Holy Spirit, you can't get the job done that God wants done. It doesn't happen. So, the similarity here in verse 1, let this mind be in you, the same mind, the similar, it requires us to be humble, and it requires us to follow Jesus' example of depending upon the Spirit of God for His enablement. Because I'm telling you, the very Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus of Nazareth to live his life and to fulfill his mission on this earth, that is the same Holy Spirit that we have if we are believers. He's our Holy Spirit. In fact, that verse that I read already from Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and how he went about uh, you know, performing his ministry. Listen how close that is represented in what is promised us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But after that, meaning at Pentecost, after that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you and ye shall be my witnesses. See? It's the Holy Spirit's anointing. It's the Holy Spirit's filling that enables us to be His witnesses. Just as it was the Holy Spirit's anointing, it was the Holy Spirit's filling that enabled Jesus to be the Father's witness. And so we follow His example of dependency. The bulk, listen to me, the bulk of Jesus' daily life was lived as the Holy Spirit empowered him as a man. And I'm telling you, that's how you and I as believers are to live our life as well. I hope this encourages you. Because I think, as I began this message by saying, I'm, I think that most believers simply assume that Jesus did what he did because he was God. But he did it because he was dependent upon the Holy Spirit as a human being, and yet fully God. Jump down with me in Philippians chapter 2, then to verse 13. Here's the third thing. They all end in I-T-Y, if you've noticed. Humility, in verses 6 to 8. Similarity, in verse 5. And the third thing I want to talk about tonight is ability. Ability. Verse 13 says, It is God which worketh in you both to will or desire and to do or perform His, that is God's, good pleasure. Where do we get our ability from? To do the will of God. To do what God wants us to do. The same place that Jesus got His. From the Holy Spirit. From God Himself. The Holy Spirit that gave the human Jesus the desires that He had to obey His Father's will and to fulfill His Father's mission does the same thing in you and me. If you're a believer. The Holy Spirit stirs up godly ambition within us to love God and to seek God and to do God's will. And you know what God's will is? God's will is that we love. God's will is that we forgive. God's will is that we serve others. And it's the Holy Spirit of God that puts that desire in our heart. You know what the difference is between a Christian that is selfish versus a Christian that is unselfish? It is all about whether or not that believer yields to the Spirit of God that lives within them or not. Amen. Simple as that. If you have any good and godly desires, it didn't come from you. It didn't come from your flesh. God never, never touches the flesh and sanctifies it. It's good for nothing. He totally bypasses our, our selfish nature. It's the Spirit of God in your human spirit that stirs up these godly desires. It is God that works in you to will. But He doesn't stop there. He doesn't just give you good ambitions and good godly desires, he then takes the next step. And to do. He gives you the desire, and he gives you the power. Jesus took on our human nature, and he accepted dependence on the Spirit of God to empower him to live a holy, obedient life, and to fulfill his God-given mission. And that same Holy Spirit indwells you if you're a believer. 
And you can and you must learn, like Jesus did, to depend upon him. You said Jesus had to learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Hebrews tells us he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He was a human being. Jesus learned how to bring glory to his Father in a physical body like you and I have, right in the middle of a sinful world like we live in. And on earth, the Messiah got his strength as he drew close to his Father and he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. What is there different than in us? That's the same way that we succeed in the Christian life. The filling of the Spirit allowed Jesus to endure, to overcome, and even conquer the world. And that same gift that he received from the Father is now a gift that is yours through dependence upon him. If you felt like as a believer you've worked hard and you've tried your best and you just never, never really experienced what Jesus calls the abundant life. Well, have you been living on the basis of your own natural ability? Or have you learned to depend upon the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? I read about a preacher that uh, when he got done uh, with his message at the close of a service, a stranger walked up to him and basically said, you know, I didn't really like what you preached. You spoke too much about the cross and the death of Christ. I think it would be much better if you spoke less of that and spoke more about the example of Jesus, the great teacher. And the preacher said, well... If I presented Christ that way as the great teacher and example, would you follow him? And the man said, absolutely, I'd follow him. And the preacher said, all right then, let's take the first step. He did no sin. Can you follow him in that? Can you claim that for yourself? And, of course, looked confused and, of course not. I acknowledge I do sin. The preacher said, then you don't need an example. You need a Savior. Amen. And if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you don't need him to be an example to you. You need him to be your Savior. But once he is your Savior, once you have received him and the forgiveness of sin, then Jesus becomes your example. And in a way that I just shared with you from the book of Philippians tonight, he is the believer's greatest example. He is your pattern for power. And it's not power for yourself. It's not power for no reason. It's power to simply fulfill the purpose for which God saved you and put you here. He's the great example. He's your pattern for power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time tonight. And I pray that, first of all, the folks that listened, understood, and as a result of understanding, had been encouraged because they realized that they had been indwelled as believers with the same Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus to fulfill his mission here on this earth. Lord, teach us to depend upon you for wisdom and for the ability <coughs> to do your will to obey you so that we not only get our desires and our leading from you but we also then draw our enablement from you as well we pray this in Jesus name Amen. Mm -hmm.